<laughs> I'm Daniel Michael. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Uh, my sobriety date this go round is April 13th, 2014. You know, this isn't my first go round, of course. You know, it took me a good knock in the head to decide to wake up and see the truth again. But before I get to that, the first time I ever drank, I was 10 years old. And it was my godfather who was like watching us babysitting or something. And he, uh, he gave me some wine and got me drunk in the lesson. That's a heck of a first time of drinking, you know what I'm saying? But <clears throat> it happened a couple more times, of course. But from that day on, I can look back and see where that killed my self-esteem. That killed my manliness. You know, I was so worried about everybody thinking I was going to be gay or something like that, you know? Just because of what happened to me. And... I held on to that. They told me to go to a group. I went one time and there was a group of guys like our age. You know what I'm saying? Here I am 10 years old and I ain't want to hear that shit. I was like, nah. I was like, that's it, I'm gone. You know, I never went back. So I just bottled that stuff up. And I, the sick thing is, is growing up in a family of nothing but addicts and alcoholics, I grew up into the lifestyle thinking that was just normal. But I also got to use that against my grandmother and my dad, too. If y'all hadn't put me in that position, you know, I wouldn't be like this. You know, I wouldn't have had that happen. Give us money. You know what I'm saying? That's how it was. <laughs> I would manipulate it using that. That was the only time I talked about it, when I wanted to get something out of it. But uh, I went on through, you know, in school. I went to T.O. Hannah, of course. Everybody knows radio. You know, that's, he's still there, too, I think. But I played sports all through school, and I'm actually was pretty good. I mean, in the 10th grade, I had Auburn, Anderson College, which is Anderson University. Now, Anderson College and Clemson come scout me already. With a C average, because I didn't really give a crap about school, I'm just being honest. And that was just in baseball. I played basketball and football, too. You know? But I was well-liked in school. You know, I was sort of the cool, I was cool, you know, in the cool crowd. But I still never felt like I fit in. No matter how good and how everybody patted me on the back, I never felt good enough for anything, <clears throat> you know? And about the end of the 10th grade, I started drinking a little bit here and there, you know, the high school partying. And come to find out, I should have known I had an issue when they're drinking cases of eight ball, old English, mm -hmm. and they're passing out, and there's like five or six of them less, and I'm over there getting them and taking them with me. You know, and I'm still drinking, and all of them are passed out, and I'm like 15 years old. You know, I should have realized I had an issue then, but I just wanted to party. And I liked the way it made me feel because I felt like I fit in once I took that drink, you know. And, of course, I started smoking pot and all that. Uh, my dumb ass dropped out of school when I was 17 because my family was pushing the aspect of thinking I was going to be their meal ticket. You know, I was going to save the family, make the money, go pro, blah, blah, blah. And I had a guy I grew up with on my block that moved to Atlanta that got a great connection with marijuana. So at 17 years old, I started trafficking marijuana from Atlanta to Anderson. <coughs> I mean, not trying to make it a war story, but I was getting a 50 pound bail for $10,000. And if you add that up, that's $200 a pound. I'm 17 years old making all this money. Who the hell cares about school? <laughs> I mean, that was what I was thinking. I was like, damn school, you know what I'm saying? And the problem with that is, is that I started living that lifestyle. I started going to the clubs early age. I started hanging out with all the gangsters and all that. You know, I thought I was Tupac. You know, that's what I grew up thinking I had to be gangster because of what I was doing, toting guns. I mean, you name it, I've done it. And I've probably done a lot of shit that I don't even know I've done, honestly. Because when I drink, I'm a full-fledged Irish boy. All corners of my damn family is Irish. So I'm bred to be a drunk. From 17 till I was about 24, I could drink a case of beer a day like it was nothing. You wouldn't even know I was drinking. You know, I, you would, my grandmother told me when I was 19, I lived across the road from her, and I'd come down to check on her because, of course, all my uncles and everybody was in damn prison because, you know, the lifestyle. And I'd come down there to check on her every morning about 9 o'clock, and I, she said, Daniel, there's... Not a day that goes by you don't walk down here every morning with a beer in your hand. You're going to be worse than your dad every day. I'm like, oh, fuck that. 
I no, hell no. You know, I'm never gonna be that bad. He's a drunk. I'm not an alcoholic. I can handle my crap, you know. But I became probably three or four times worse than my dad ever was, you know. The bad thing is, is I'd go watch the race with him on Sunday, drink all his beer, he'd pass out, and I'd steal the rest. And he'd think he, I'd make him think we'd drink it all before he fell asleep because he worked 13 hours. He's an iron worker, so, you know, he'd come in, drink, pass out, and get up and do it again the next day, you know. But I didn't think I had an issue, you know. The money was a big issue with me because I used it to get everybody to like me. They would be everybody in here and Rodney not like me, and I'd go buy a damn car just to get him to like me, even if I don't even like his ass. You know, literally, that's how insecure of a person I was. You know, I wanted everybody to like me. I lived off my pride my whole life. I lived off what you thought I should be instead of just being myself. And the drinking took that feeling away of uselessness and not fitting in. And then, of course, there's a lot of drugs happened after that. When I was 24, I found meth. And if anybody knows anything about meth, if you're an alcoholic and you do meth, you can drink like a damn fish and never feel it. So that fell right into my ballpark, honestly. It just let me drink a lot more. It just wasted a lot of alcohol, honestly. But, of course, I, when I was 21, my best friend that was my partner in all this, he lived on the other side of the block with me that I grew up with, he, uh, he's dead gone now due to this disease, man. You know, this disease finally got him, honestly. But he, we were at his house and we'd been drinking. Cause this is, of course, right before I started doing really any drugs. And they doing a little coke here and there in the back, you know, partying. So we'd been on a drinking spree a couple of days straight. They started drinking tequila. And I'm one of the ones that, though I'm an alcoholic, when it comes to tequila, I'm a wuss. I could take one shot of tequila and be all right. If I take that second one, I'm puking everything up. It's just, I don't like the taste of it, but I can drink a freaking gallon of vodka like it ain't nothing. You know? That's crazy. But they were drinking, you know, and they were starting to get wild. Him and his wife got into it, started arguing, and he pulled his pistol out and he pointed it at her and I just grabbed him, you know, told him, what the hell are you doing? You know, what the hell? Well, he started talking about killing himself and all that. His wife left. She was going to leave him, this, that, and the other. And you know how we get, man, when we get mad about that. The only issue with this is, is he put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. But it didn't go off. And this guy, when I'm talking about it, anybody that knows who this guy when I'm talking about kept one in the chamber at all times because he was the most paranoid motherfucker I've ever known in my life. He thought everybody was out to get us, you know? That's when I knew he was for real, and I just instinctively grabbed a gun. We tripped over one of them raggedy little plastic laundry baskets. I'll never forget it was blue. Raggedy ass thing. Fell on the uh, couch, and he shot me point blank with a Ruger 45 P90 right in the throat. Well, honestly, I mean, I could say that he shot me, but I don't know if I might have pulled the trigger, honestly, because I grabbed the gun. Uh, the blessing was, as I looked up at him and told him, now his dumb ass has got to take me to the hospital. <clears throat> I thought I was shot in the shoulder because my arm went dead. So I automatically, you know, I think that's probably why I didn't go in the shop. Uh, I tried to go outside. By the time we got out to go to the car, I fell out. I started pissing the shit on myself. I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, I'm laying down and then I'm still look up at Brandon and I'm like, dude, go get all the guns and the weed out of the house. The cops are gonna come. You know, what the, who, what normal person thinks about that? <laughs> You're sitting there bleeding to death. You know, I didn't know I was shot in the throat, but I knew I was bleeding like hell, you know? <laughs> the reality is, is that's just my alcoholic and addict thinking, you know? But I was laying on the ground, I'll never forget it, it was October 15th, it just happened to be cold. And I'm laying there, and my grandmother's neighbor, Pico, come running up, and he's like, Daniel, pray. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm way ahead of you, I've been praying. You know, I'm dying, I know what time it is. And I started pissing shit on him, I knew I was dying. You know? <clears throat> I remember the ambulance getting there, and this is why I'm in and out, it's pretty funny, is that I remember starting to cut my clothes off, and then, you know, of course, they do the trait. Like, hell, I got shot in the throat, they had to. And they start pulling, I'm telling them, quit, it hurts. Like, they can't even believe I'm talking, for one thing. And they cut my pants off, and I had a little 25 in my back pocket. <laughs> and they, like, freak out because I got a gun. I'm like, I'm dying, you asshole. Damn that gun, you know? But I get to the hospital, and I'm out for a week. 
I come to and I looked over and I was like, you know, is Brandon okay? And they were like, yeah, he's all right. He didn't do nothing. You know, of course, probation is on him. But I was like, man, that idiot shot me in the damn shoulder. And they were like, nah, he shot you in the throat. I'm like, well, I pushed that button like 10 times. I went right back out. Two days later, I woke up with the detectives and all, of course, on me. They tried to say it was an argument because they'd been watching us for two years between us, and he tried to knock me off. They were trying to bury his ass. But the messed up thing was, is the gun, the reason it didn't go off, is that it wasn't his. We had matching chrome Ruger 45 special editions, and somehow during the day we had swapped. Mm -hmm. And I never kept one in the chamber, to be honest, I didn't want to shoot myself. Ironic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why it didn't go off, you know? They said, well, how did he get a hold of your gun? Which wasn't in my name, I was already a felon, so I'm just gonna be honest, it was in my baby mama's name for a while. It was like, well, how did you get shot with your own gun? And I'm like, I don't know, it ain't my gun, it ain't got my name on it, you know? <laughs> Playing the whole fifth color. But I never realized that, honestly, until I went through the step work about that issue. Why that gun didn't go off, it had to be nothing but God, you know? I, I don't know, and, and I'll just be honest, if anybody ever goes to shoot themselves in front of me again, I'm just going to have to deal with that post-traumatic stress and I'm not grabbing a gun, I promise you. Because I suffer every day from that, you know? And it's hard. Because I'm an addict and I know an alcoholic and I know I can't deal with it the way I want to deal with it, you know? But, of course, I lost my arm for two years because it went through the main branch nerves in my right shoulder. Now, don't ask me how, like I say, it went in right there and come out. I don't, I can't, I don't know. It's only God. And I still was living that gangster lifestyle. It gave me more cred. I was walking, I was so stupid, I was walking around, I had to wear a sling the whole time, the way my arm wouldn't, you know, drop. And I would walk around with a gun in my sling, thinking it's cool. What the hell are we thinking? You know what I'm saying? What are you thinking? You, you, you just got shot and all this. And you're still doing the same dumb shit. After I did that foxhole prayer for the first time, I'll never do this shit again if you let me live, God. First thing I did when I got out of the hospital, went straight to the liquor store, got a half gallon of vodka, went to the store next door, got a 12 pack of Bud Light and a, a gallon, I mean a pint of V8. Cause that's my drink, vodka and V8. I was a pure alcoholic, but I love that shit. <laughs> Normal people don't do that. You just got shot in the throat and died three times. And you, oh, I'll tell you what, that was my first experience with Oxycontin too. That's when it first came out, they gave me that thing and I, I told you I'm an alcoholic. So I started drinking through it. I puked the whole time. I never took another one. That was the last time I ever took one of them. So I got blessed that God helped me there and not let me get a, get a hold of them at the right time. You know? But my ways led me to about six months later, a guy came in, wore a wire on me and Brandon. The cops come in, busted us, of course. You know? I beat it at the preliminary hearing because they didn't come in on a warrant. Nobody let them in. They just came in on the wire. So, of course, I got... Anderson County shitting right now because they can't. This is the second time I've got away with it, you know. And of course, my alcoholic mind tells me I'm untouchable, you know. They can't get me apparently, you know. Yeah, that didn't last long. <laughs> my mind, my stupid mind, my alcoholic mind told me, okay, they've been watching me for all this time and they're selling all this weed. Everybody's doing meth now, so I sell this. You know, I don't do meth. I drink. You know, I drink smoke weed. And then of course I get the bright idea that, you know, to make more money, I'll do a little bit of meth to stay up. You know, because I'm tired of all these people calling me all day and not long. You know? And that that was that was where it started going really downhill. I got busted. I get, I know y'all like live P D and all that crap, right? I swear I probably should have been on cops, no lie. And this is this was I'm serious. I was in a little Honda Accord, no license. Lights under it, tinted when the system going three of course three o'clock in the morning. We do the great we drive around at great times at night. <laughs> the cops behind me, and I know he's behind me, but I'm going to speed limit because I'm like I hate no problem right now. As soon as I bear off to go to my road, it's a bear off about a half, I was a half a block from my house. And I bear off and the speed limit changed and he blew like me. Mm -hmm. I've been up for three days drinking like hell. I got a twelve pack of Bud Light sitting here. I got a little hair cutting box full of dope, a pistol under my seat. No license. I ain't know what I was doing, honestly. He comes walking up to the car and he's like, 
you got your license registration? I was like, I ain't got my license, but I got my social security card. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as he got halfway to his car, I hauled ass. Because I knew I was right there near my house, and there was a bridge right there, a little swamp area, and I started, and I threw everything off. You know, I threw everything in there. But I gave him like a 30 minute run, no lie. Just running around, I had them, I, I had brand new rims, you know, low profiles on the Honda, and they back there squilling around, and I'm using my turn signal passing. <laughs> <laughs> They finally threw out the stop sticks and I stopped in front of them because they didn't want to mess up my new tires that I just put on my car. <laughs> so I went ahead and jumped out of the car and they about to whip my ass. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> they threw me in the front seat of the car and I'm going, oh hell, anybody sees me in the front seat of this cop car, they gonna think I'm ratting on people and I'm gonna get killed. You know? <laughs> the funny thing is, is the state trooper that put me in the car, he looked up and he's got all the county guys that were behind him chasing me. And he said, man, where the hell did you learn to drive like that? <laughs> and I was like, PlayStation. <laughs> I thought that dude was going to drag me out of the car and whip my ass for real. But um, I got put on probation for that one. I lasted a whole three months. Three months is all it took. I violated twice, failed two piss tests, signed ones that don't even waste it. You know, I couldn't stop. You know, no matter what, I could not stop. I would tell myself that I'm going to probation in three days. I'm just going to drink get high today. And I'll drink those three days and get it all out of my system and go report and pass the piss test. And what would happen? And I'd start and never stop. You know, after that, I turned around and when I violated, you know, I was thinking, oh, it's a slap on the wrist. It's the first time I've ever been on probation. It's the first time I've ever been to court about violations. And I'm going to get a little slap on the wrist. So I probably would. Because the funny thing about it is I go to court, and I've been up for days, because I already, I already figured you know, in the back of my mind something was going to happen. And I'm like nodding out, you know what I'm saying, in the courtroom. <laughs> and the judge even said, hey, sir, you need to wake up. <laughs> One time I was like, oh, shit. But they call me up there, and he's like, Mr. McAllister, I'll tell you what, I'll reinstate your probation if you can pass the piss test right now. I was like, well, Your Honor, uh, I smoked a lot of weed last night and drank like hell because I figured I was going to prison. He said, well, you know what, Mr. McAllister? If you just fell for weed, I'll reinstate your probation. That I went and pissed, and that probation officer looked at me and said, you knew you was about to light up every damn thing on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> he made an example of me. He gave me my whole five years. So I go and, you know, of course, you ain't got no choice. That's one thing I had to finish in life was a prison sentence. The ones they got you, your ass ain't getting out. <laughs> so I... Uh, I go through it, and I'm going to just tell you this, the whole time in there, I was watching people come in and out, in and out, go on parole, come back, come back. I said I was not going to be one of them that had that revolving door effect, you know? I was never going to do what I was doing. I never was going to use it. I never was going to drink, you know? Hell, I learned more in prison about making everything than I did before I went to prison and selling it, you know? You go in there, becoming graduate out of all kinds of stuff. And I get out. And within two weeks, I'm drunk and high again. After four plus years of my sentence, because of course I lost a lot of good time. You know, I was a dumbass. I had to be cool in prison. I had to fit in. I had to be hard ass. You know, and I said I would never do it again, and it didn't matter. After four plus years, you know, I called myself being sober because I didn't do nothing but abuse what little bit of prescription medicine I had, which wasn't none of it narcotic. They weren't giving me that shit. You know? Thank God somebody helped me when I had a moment of clarity and got me into a treatment center. Of course, I'll be on that. And that was in 2007. That was February 1st. I got there, and within two, no, the third day there, I found out what the hell was wrong with me. You know, all this time I knew I was mentally retarded. I mean, something in my mind was messed up. That was easy to say. You didn't have to tell me that. It was just in my mind. I knew I was retarded. Or why else was I doing all this crap? You know? But when they started talking about that I was allergic to drugs and alcohol, it explained the allergy. One drink, one craving, two drinks, two cravings, three, four. That's why there's never enough. That answered to me why I couldn't stop the probation. Why I couldn't stop for my kids. Why once I put it in, I wasn't stopping for nobody. Because I couldn't. There was no, once you set that demon off, you're not stopping. You know, unless you're physically removed, run out of ways of getting drunk and high, or just get locked up, usually. You know? 
once I learned that, it went from my head to my heart. It's like page 30, it talks about we had to concede to our innermost selves. Once I started putting all my experiences with that illness of the mind, illness of the body, and I can, all of us, man, if you're an alcohol guy, you know you got thousands of examples. You know, when your mind's lied to you and you believed it, running to the truth that you can't stop, you know. And the reality is, is when they told me I couldn't change because I had the illness of the spirit concept and they started talking about God, I was like, oh, damn, that shit. You know, I did not want to hear nothing about God. Because I came into these rooms with the concept of a cryptic God. If there was one, he did not like my ass. You know, he was all punishing. I was the redheaded stepchild that was constantly just getting screwed over. Why else was I molested, stabbed, shot, put in prison, lost everything? Dad did this to my baby mom, blah, blah, blah. You know, dad's in prison for shit, you know? Why else is like, poor me? All self pity, really, you know? And then. I got to the part in the book where it talks about selfishness and self-centeredness. You know, the one that's probably highlighted in everybody's book that's got one. <laughs> that very bottom paragraph where it says, first of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. How the hell could I be mad at a God that I've been my whole life? It's been my decisions, my choices, my actions that put me in all the places that I had been in. But yet I just run out of people to blame. And I sure as hell don't want to blame myself, so I blame God. You know? But the beauty of this program is, is I didn't have to come in here and believe what you believe or go with what I had a concept of at the moment. But I just believed who was up, the men's director then, which is my sponsor today actually, was up there bouncing around, happy as hell. You know, had his family back in his life. He was two years sober. He was from my hometown. You know, whatever changed this crazy ass might have changed me. That's how I got my beginning. My third step prayer was basically to whom it concerns. I can't do this shit on my own. Please help me. Why? Because it said A, the B, and C that I had to be convinced of that. Oh, yeah, I was convinced that I was an addict, alcoholic. And I was convinced I'm the problem. And I'm convinced because of step two that I'm not the solution. Because I've tried it my way so many times and it never worked. So the third step worked, though, because it came from my heart. I meant it. You know? And I made it through the step work. And by the time I got to the ninth step, I had my own conception of God. I just chose to call it God. I didn't know what it was. I just knew something in my life was going good. I got a job the first time in my damn life. You know, I was paying my rent. I was taking care of myself. You know, I was doing the right thing. I was helping others. My selfish ass helping others. You know? And the messed up thing is, is I never even seem to change everybody around me did. Because we can't see ourselves usually. You know, we usually have to have somebody tell us. Why do you think we have to have the fellowship? That's the second part of the solution. I gotta be around like-minded people that'll tell me when I'm screwing up. Because my mind's gonna justify it, that I have that right to be pissed off. You know? I have to have somebody that knows me good enough to say, hey Daniel, and not care about my feelings, honestly. Say, Daniel, you don't wanna take a look at these people. You know, you're not acting right, something's wrong. Without that, without that in my life, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Because I made it seven years and I was working at the treatment center up here in Florence. And then I went back home just because of some disagreements I had with politics I'll say and I had a job and I went home because my oldest son was turning five he was starting school so I wasn't going to get him as much you know met my beautiful wife you know with the job I had waiting tables and, uh, <laughs> I tell you God does have jokes sometimes he'll make you practice 10, 11, 12 I promise you <laughs> but I made it like two years and then I took a job working a lot of hours, late nights, by myself, constantly riding around the forklift with nothing but me. And eventually me not doing what I'm supposed to do by calling my sponsor, going to meetings, or telling myself or doing anything. And actually, you know, quit retiring freaking a year before that probably. I got, well, I got drunk first. I went on a drinking spree for a while. And my wife could tell you, man, she's seen, she's not one of them. She's seen where I started drinking, just a little bit, then more, then more, then drinking in the mornings. And then she really knew it when I stole her nasty ass wine one time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was on a Sunday and I run out and I drink that nasty. But I drank it though, I ain't gonna lie, I killed the hell out of it. <laughs> I share that because the fact is, is it don't matter how long you got sober, if you quit doing what this it says, it don't take long because that demon is down there doing push-ups. I came in 
to AA, a drunk, and a meth addict, and found out I'm also a drunk and I like crack too. Because it could have been anything, honestly, but it just happened to be crack. Don't ask me why. Hey, he's, I pulled up, thinking I'm going to stay at the motel room because we were fussing, and I'm like, I'm just going to drink it off and go, go to pass out and then go to work. Pull up, dude, like, you want some weed? I was like, nah, you got some heart? I said, that, I mean, that's how our minds work. I never thought one time about anything. Just like that. I had plenty of alcohol in there. I mean, my mind wanted something else because that alcohol wasn't working anymore. I got so bad, so fast, that all that bullshit I went through before the seven years didn't have shit on that little six to eight month run thing I went on. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's why they say it always gets worse, never better. I almost lost everything. You know, my job tried to help me. You know, friends reached out to me. And finally, I got a call from a guy that saved a lot of people's lives, and I would have never expected it at 3 o'clock in the morning sitting in a motel room with a bunch of drugs and sitting here with a bunch of alcohol. And he calls me and don't ask me at 3 o'clock in the morning what the hell I answered it for. I don't know. That's why I know it was God in the moment of clarity, apparently. But I answered it, and he was in Tampa, and he's like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know where you at, too. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm looking at him. You know, we picked a great motel room with spray-painted windows and all that shit. So I'm like looking at him. And I'm over here like he could see me getting high, just being honest with you, y'all. I'm like over here like he could see me through the phone getting high. He's like, Daniel, quit. Put that shit down and talk to me. He told me to finish what I had. I called, called my sponsor. They come grab me. And it was hard, man. Because when you relapse after having some time, man, the first thing I remember Bradley telling me was if you notice people that have a lot of time and they relapse, they come in and out of the rooms a lot after that because of pride. We care about so much of what everybody in these rooms think of us. Oh, Daniel, you've saved so many people. Oh, Daniel, you've helped people. You do good meetings, Daniel, blah, 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 blah. Who gives a shit? You know, it's not me. That's, that's God working through me because if it was me, I'd all be high and drunk right now. You know? And I'd be trying to steal shit from you. you know? <laughs> but the reality is, is God working through me, I could tell y'all my experience and tell you the truth of what the hell's really wrong with us. You know, because a lot of people don't know these days. You know, they think, oh, they just admit I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, that's easy. But why are you genuinely with alcoholics? So you beat that into somebody they don't really know. You know, I didn't know I was a genuine addict or alcoholic. I could say, yeah. I was, my life was power. I was powerless over drugs and alcohol. My life was unmanageable. Well, yeah, my life sucked. That's easy. You, know, you end up in a treatment center or something. Yeah, your life's unmanageable. Holy shit. You know, you're in a treatment center. But until it was broke down to me where it would go to my heart, I think that moment of clarity would have never worked a second time. Because I was in the middle of it. Again. And I got to see the truth of what I had learned and been teaching for so long. You know? And my pride almost didn't allow me to even step back in these rooms. I was ashamed. I beat myself up, of course. I worried about what everybody's been thinking. And guess what? Walking in these doors, not, not one damn member of AA ever judged me. <coughs> I remember Rodney being one of the first ones to come see me. Never judged me one time. You know, still one of the great ones. <laughs> I remember, hey, I'm just being honest. I remember that man when he walked in the door. Uh, Logan, see him now for eight plus years? Nine? Shit, I don't know. Ten? Oh, damn, I'm old. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> damn, no one needs to talk about being old. <laughs> <laughs> to see that, that's why I know it works. You know, to see y'all, people that's going to pick up chips tonight. You know, to me, to almost have four years again. You know, I, I know this works, but I also know that if I don't do it, what's going to happen? I've got that experience. And my goal in life right now is to help other people not go through that shit. You know? I try to help all these young wannabe ass gangsters to try to realize that that's not the way to live. You know, it's not gonna get you nothing but jail and shot and dead, probably. You know? And it's even hell because the fact is is that society pushes all that. Partying and everything like that's a cool thing to do. You know? It's, it's an epidemic out there right now. And just to be honest, you know, that heroin and fentanyl right now is killing everybody. 
I'm up to 197 people since 2007 that's dead due to this disease of addiction. And, and, and get a call constantly right now, especially because I'm dealing with a lot of people from up north right now, from Chicago, you know, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, you know, and getting a call from their family members, that's one of the hardest things in the world to have to go through. To talk to somebody's mom or dad after their kid just overdosed and died. Knowing they knew the truth, though, that's what's fucked up. Is knowing that I knew they knew what to do. You know, that's why I won't go to nobody's funeral. Because I'm not going to go to somebody's funeral when everybody else is remembering them as a drug addict or alcoholic piece of crap when I know what that person can be sober. You know, I know the change in them and I know that person and that's what I want to remember. You know, but the book wrote in the 1930s tells us a bunch of times that we have to do some must for it being suggested or we'll die. And the reality is it's an epidemic and the only way you can change an epidemic is by me helping two people, then two people helping two people, and so on and so on and so on. And that's how we can kill the epidemic. But we have to do it together. We do. You know, you hear the cliche all the time that this is a we program. There's a reason. Because if I'm by myself and I start isolating, I get high. I get drunk. I hurt everybody I love. But with people like-minded in my life and this program of action, I can stay sober the rest of my life and I know it. Uh, I'll end pretty much with the, my favorite little paragraph in the whole book. It's page 53. It talks about God is everything or he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What's your choice to be? You know, today he's got to be everything. Because if he's not everything, I'm not nothing. You know, I'm not nothing but that piece of crap that's hurt everybody I love. But with God, I'm up here talking to y'all right now. Which used to be one of my biggest fears in the world anyway. And now you can't get me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank y'all for the dinner and inviting me to come. Thank y'all.